Secretary of State for the United States of America, Anthony Blinken, two weeks ago visited Nigeria. From his visit, the United States of America and Nigeria signed a $2.17 billion, development, uh, billion dollar development uh, objective agreement, which will play a role in supporting a healthier and more educated Nigeria. According to him, the agreement will also promote and expand energy access, economic growth and revitalize democracy. He stated, home to Africa's largest population, democracy and economy, Nigeria is for or is one of our most important partners on the continent. Well, joining us to discuss this is U.S. Consulate Public Affairs Officer, Lagos, Stephen Ibeli. Thank you very much for joining us, Stephen. It's great it's to be here. It's good to have here. you join us. You were here just a couple of weeks ago. It's great to be back, Maria. <laughs> great. Um, so it's very interesting when we hear about the U.S., and Nigeria having relations, and these relations span through trade, education. 61 years of great relations. Yeah. Wow, great. It's as old as our um, democracy, uh, rather our independence. Correct. It's that old. But yet, we know that Secretary Blinken visited Nigeria two weeks ago. How, in your opinion, will this visit uh, help strengthen and improve the relationship between Nigeria and the U.S.? That's a great question, Marianne. Um, as you really said in your intro, uh, Nigeria has the largest population in Africa, the biggest economy uh, as well, and, and really it's the largest democracy on, on the continent. And so this heft, this gravitas, really makes Nigeria our most important partner on the continent. And not only on the continent, but indeed on the world stage. Um, and so Secretary Blinken visited um, on the 18th and 19th. This was actually following a virtual visit that happened in April. Um, so very, very early on in the Biden administration, um, there was a virtual visit to Nigeria because there is this realization, of course, that Nigeria is a partner, not only in regional politics, but indeed uh, in international politics. So it was a very busy visit. Um, he met with the president, the vice president, and the foreign minister. Uh, as you alluded to, there was a signing of this uh, wonderful agreement, this $2.7 mm -hmm. billion assistance agreement. He met with civil society actors. He also met with techpreneurs. Well, that's very good. As well. Um, and so it was it was really a great a great way to talk about the importance of Nigeria. And there really is nothing more important than a face-to-face -face visit. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that the secretary was very keen on doing that following the virtual visit in April. Mm. Now, can you give us more insight into this $2.17 billion uh, development objective assistance agreement by, um, you know, the U.S. and Nigeria? What exactly um, will these monies be put to? Because you've mentioned that they met with tech entrepreneurs, they met with, you know, civil society. And is the U.S. going to monitor how these monies are being put to use? Absolutely. It's, it's through our U.S. Um, Agency for International Development, or USAID, as they say. A lot of it is going into sort of primary health care, so health helping children um, really get the best medical care that they can. So there's a lot of investment in that. There's a lot of investment in education as well. Um, the children are the future, right? I mean, they are the next generation. They're the next leaders of this country. And mm -hmm. so we're really investing in that with our Nigerian partners. We never do this alone. Um, we always do this with local partners, with local partnerships, uh, with people that are very committed, with Nigerians that are very, very committed uh, to this. And so. This really, I think, will help sort of strengthen the resiliency, strengthen also the health of, of the Nigerian uh, population. And that is just really one rubric of a really deep uh, relationship uh, between our two countries. Let's talk about Blinken's visit. Um, one of the high points was his engagement with some of Nigeria's leading civil society, just as you said. Um, what was the key takeaway for the um, secretary when, um, from these meetings? Um, of course, because this is also to help him understand what's happening within the country and, of course, how the consulate can help um, better their relationship you know, with the country. So what was his biggest takeaway when he um, left and had meetings with you? Um, what did he take home with him? Well, I think he heard and saw the vibrancy of civil society in Nigeria. Uh, we as U.S. government are big believers in the power of civil society as a check on the government, as uh, a mechanism for accountability and, and transparency. Uh, and whether that's for press freedom or whether that's for institutions, building institutions, because 
that is really the key to any success in any democracy mm. is free, open, and transparent uh, institutions. And I think you heard that loud and clear from uh, from the from the civil society actors that were that were present. We really believe that that is a rubric for a very healthy democracy. Is a strong, vibrant civil society. I just want to chip in that um, one of the key things that I also noticed when I visited the U.S. was that civil society had so much power uh, in putting the government on their toes and making sure that things happened. Um, and that I put that side by side with what happens at home. And well not necessarily scratching the surface. Is there a, a plan of sorts to engage more with civil society so they understand the power that they wield? And of course, because we are in a growing democracy of sorts, um, how, how, and um, knowing that these people can also help our democracy grow, is the U.S. Um, going to do something about that? Absolutely. We engage civil society leaders on a daily basis, you know, whether that's with police reform or whether that's with press freedom. The ambassador actually today, who's in Lagos, visited the, the Nigerian Guild of Editors um, that, that have a grant from the United States to really talk about these rubrics of freedom and, and how we put those together to, to really go forward to building the strong institutions. Because mm -hmm. that is the strength of a country, it's its institutions. The institutions are able to really to able to um, to be able to move with changes in the society. It yeah. doesn't depend on an, an individual. It doesn't depend on one particular event. This is where we really are investing in in these institutions. And indeed, civil society is its own institution as well. Mm. Now, uh, what does the U.S. government think of Nigeria's engagement, uh, you know, and leadership on the continent? Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, has it improved? Has it deteriorated? Are we going around in circles? This is why I'm asking. When I was a little girl, Nigeria was referred to as the big brother on the continent. It was also the giant of Africa. But then we've, we've gone through the motions and I'm thinking, what does the U.S. see, um, you know, about Nigeria's leadership right now? No, that's a great question, Marianne. Um, we see Nigeria not only as, as really a regional power, but also a world power. Um, if you look at many prominent Nigerians, they are heading many of the institutions. The Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations is Nigerian. Um, the head of the WTO, Nigerian. Um, there are Nigerians everywhere. Uh, the president of the African Development Bank, for example, Afrexim Bank, uh, Africa Exim Bank. Um, and so you see Nigerians really interspersed through all of these world, uh, world organizations and all of these um, institutions. Not only that, but also in the United States. Uh, there are 500,000 Nigerians living in the United States. That is the biggest diaspora in the world. Um, and many of them have leadership positions, not only in the Biden cabinet, but also in many of the institutions. The Deputy Treasury Secretary is Nigerian. Um, the Surgeon General in the state of Florida, actually, is Nigerian. Um, and so we see Nigerians really taking that, that leadership leadership role. And that's just on the political sphere. Look at the cultural sphere. Mm. I mean, Nigeria is an exporter of, of culture. Um, and you see many people cheering for Nigerian athletes uh, that play in the NBA. You hear people listening to Nigerian music. Oh, I just, I, I saw the former CSIS boss uh, saying he was dancing to some Afro music. And exactly. it was really interesting. Burna Boy, Wizkid, right? I mean, Tiwa Savage, Davido, and the list goes on and on. Um, and so, it also, you know, P uh, Americans also read Nigerian authors now as well. So you really see that kind of nexus between Nigeria's sort of cultural influence, their political influence, mm -hmm. their economic influence as well. And this is why the secretary was here, mm. um, to engage Nigeria, to really reaffirm that relationship and to really build and go forward on that relationship as well. Mm. So what are the key areas uh, of cooperation and people-to-people -people ties you know, um, uh, on the, that underscore the journey of U.S.-Nigeria relationship? Uh, because that is uh, you know, of key interest to many people, even those who are watching right now. Absolutely. People-to-people um, -people ties are really the strength of any relationship with any country. Um, if you look at the health sector, I think that's sort of an under an underappreciated piece of, of, of the assistance that the United States brings to Nigeria. 80% uh, of all AIDS patients, for example, um, receive life-saving life -saving treatment um, uh, because of grants from the United States. 80%, 80%, really? 8 out of 10 Nigerians are receiving drugs uh, for that. We've eliminated wild polio. For example, um, we've donated millions of mosquito nets for beds, for example. 
Uh, we do a lot in the malaria space as well. So there is a huge health component. Uh, we also uh, support a lot of internally displaced persons in the north as well, over 20 million. Um, and that's just the health sector. Um, there's the security sector. There's the cultural sector. Um, so the, the relationship is, and the economic sector, and the, the relationship is, is really, really broad. Uh, we work very hard at trying to improve the business environment for American companies, and then also Nigerian companies wanting to export to the United States, mm -hmm. uh, for example. Um, you know, there are structures in place that help Nigerian companies to export, you know, really? to the United States. The and Agoa. how seamless is that? Um, there are some, obviously, some, you know, regulatory environments and, and regulatory, you know, regulations and procedures, but um, the fact is that there is a preferential uh, treatment for Africa through the AGOA framework. Um, and so a lot of people do take advantage of that. Not only that, but we also do a lot in the entrepreneurial space. Um, our ambassador actually is traveling um, to an event where we are training over 250 women in entrepreneur, entrepreneurial skills. We call it the Academy for Women Entrepreneurs. Um, and I was looking at pictures actually today that the colleague sent and all of the women had made displays of all of the wares that they've done. And they work in all fashion, in spices, in even one has a security company. Um, and so it, because the Nigerian economy is based on these small and medium enterprises, 80% of the economy is really based on that. Uh, and that's a real shared value between our countries, this entrepreneurial spirit. And mm. so um, we're really looking forward to that event that the ambassador attends tomorrow. Okay. And talking about events, uh, during the visit um, of the Secretary of State uh, to Nigeria, he, was, uh, he invited Mr. President to a summit uh, for democracy uh, that he's going to be hosting next month. So um, what more can you tell us about that? And then I'll just make this a two-pronged question. You can decide not to answer the next one. <laughs> um, but uh, the United States, I always say, is a poster child for democracy across, you know, uh, around the world. Everybody, you know, talks about the democracy that, you know, America is pushing. Um, how well do you think Nigeria has coped with this system of government? Because it's seemingly a bit new to us, being that our democracy is still about 21 years old. And America has had 200 years plus. Um, do you think that we're fast learners? Oh, absolutely. Um, democracy is like a garden. You know, you have to tend to it. You have to de-weed it. You have to really take care of it for it to to flourish. And I think you've you know, also seen in the United States, we also struggle with, with those issues as well. And that is why I think the Biden administration is really convening this summit to really renew our commitment to democracy. Democracy has a really unique factor in which we look at ourselves transparently and we say, okay, look, these are our challenges, but these are also our opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think it's a real great um, opportunity for, for us to hear from other countries what those challenges are and also what those opportunities are. That will be in uh, December 9 through 10, where many countries will be visiting uh, the United States to really, really talk about that. And I think it's really, really important because there'll also be members of civil society there. There will also be members of the private sector there. There will also be government uh, officials, of course. And so I think it's a continuous dialogue and it's also a continuous process. Democracy is a process. You have to work on it. And indeed, our Constitution says we are striving towards a more perfect union. Mm. Um, and that, that is really what we really try to do uh, in the United States, even despite our challenges. We have to look at what what those challenges are and then try to decide and try to figure out how we go forward as well. I mean, I've studied the um, American electoral system. It's the most confusing, especially... <laughs> <laughs> The electoral college, right? Especially yeah, yeah. with that. I am still trying to wrap my head around it. But, yes. but, but, but the only thing, the most important thing that works is that, um, you know, they follow the law to the later. Right. No matter what happens, you know, the law takes its cut. But I'm still trying to learn about the electoral college. I'm still trying. And I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe we could learn a thing or two from how you conduct your elections. I also noticed that there are certain parts of the country that e-voting is not necessarily a thing. But there are also places where it is a thing and maybe there's a lot for us to learn. Well, I mean, there's a lot for everyone to learn. I mean, I think COVID really taught us that, um, you know, the, the last American election had the most Americans voting in the history of elections in the United States. And that was because because of COVID in some ways that it was a lot easier to vote. You could mail in your vote, early voting, Sunday voting. Mm. And so um, but the key and, and really the key to any democracy is open, transparent elections. 
Um, and even though there were issues after the elections, as we know in the United States, what is really amazing is that there were Republicans counting votes, there were Democrats counting votes, but they weren't Republicans or Democrats, they were Americans counting the votes. Um, and they worked tire tirelessly and they worked uh, just, just to make sure that they were open, that they were transparent, and indeed when, when the votes were being counted, Press could visit, journalists could visit. There were also observers from the different political parties. So there was parties. no secrecy of, uh, of any kind. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And that is really a key. Fair, open, transparent elections are really the key. I mean, the, the absolute critical factor um, to any democracy. Um, my last question um, is about some recent happenings in Nigeria now. The U.S. government through the consulates were among some of the people who uh, called for justice for the NSAS protesters and those who uh, seemingly lost their lives, uh, according to the reports. Uh, um, I'm, I'm going to try to understand from you. Do you care to comment on the recent um, developments? Sure. Um, I mean, we haven't had a chance to see the, the paper, obviously. Um, but I think it really boils down to two things. One, trust and accountability. Um, so these reports are really important because they start to build trust back between the government and between, uh, between the people through these recommendations, through these reforms. Um, I think that is really, really important. To, you have to build that trust back through actions of the state, actions of the federal government. But at the same time, you have to hold people accountable for those that committed crimes, for those that broke the law, for those that uh, did things that were counter to the democratic principles, they have to be held accountable. And that also builds trust. Mm -hmm. When you hold people accountable for, for their actions when they break the law, that will also build trust between the government and between the people. And indeed, our ambassador said this just today, um, as our secretary said when he was here in, in November as well. Yeah, because, you know, a lot of people, even civil society, the Labour Congress, everyone was asking the secretary to talk to the president about this issue, to pressure him to make sure he does right. But uh, we heard stuff about sanctions. I don't know. I don't know if you can talk about it. But, but Nigerians are pushing that if justice is not done, there should be sanctions whatsoever from the international uh, community. Yeah, I don't think that really has been discussed. That the, you know, we're still, I think, waiting for what the recommendations that come out, what comes out from those recommendations. We're very hopeful that, um, that there will be action, that there will be reforms, that, that those uh, who did commit crimes will be held responsible, will be held accountable. Um, so I think it's really too early to talk about about those because we really need to see how this you know sort of how it this plays plays, how this plays out. Mm. But we continue to raise this publicly and privately. Um, so human rights, transparency, rule of law, free and fair open elections, those are all of the garden of democracy that I talked about. Mm -hmm. um, they all have to be very, very healthy. They all have to be um, really tended to and, and also really appreciated and looked after as well. Mm. And that would, of course, build interest in more uh, of uh, our democracy. But I want to say thank you. Stephen Ibelli is of the U.S. Consulate in Lagos. Thank you so much for Thanks, speaking Mary. with us. Thanks, Mary. I appreciate it. All right. Always a pleasure. Well, thank you all for staying with us. It's been Plus Politics. I am Mariana Kuhn. I'll see you tomorrow. Have a good night.